Hello to all gamers and people who may just be in the room while like another person's watching this. At, at which point, I just have to say, I, don't, I guess the, here's the thing. There's two kinds of people in the world, right? If I'm watching something, even if it's on the TV and I don't think my wife would be interested, I use headphones. Because I personally, I, you know, I respect the sanctity of the hearing environment. Because as soon as one person chooses that they're going to watch something out loud, that, it's not like you can then put a second thing on from that point onwards. You know, it's just the, the, the second person is forced into a headphone situation. But then there's some people who are like, no matter what I'm watching, I always got the speaker cranked. I'm, I, 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 many people are saying I'm a hero. I guess if, if hero is the word that you're going to use, then, then so be it. I'll, I'll reluctantly shoulder the mantle. I just feel like if you have my speaker, my stream on on the speakers, it's a lot of pressure on me because I don't know. Like if you're watching willfully, I think you kind of know what you're getting into. But if you're just listening ambiently from like the other room, I could embarrass you by the things that I say that the person that's in the room with you hears. Plus, you're not giving me the extra views, which is very true. Don't you heavily dislike when people listen to music on speakers in public? Yes, this is correct. I do. I told you right about the new guy just dropped. I saw him on the last week. I was taking a walk with my daughter and um, there was a guy who had a bicycle radio that he was listening to and it was blaring and he had AirPods in at the same time. The worst of both worlds. New guy just dropped. That guy's a badass. He's not a badass. That guy thinks that his music taste is so good that everybody else except for him has to hear it. Sorry, I can't hear you. I have my AirPods in. At least uh, commit to the bit and change your badge to um, listening without audio, watching without video, watching without audio, listening without video. Dude, I gotta say, I was feeling a little malaise last night as well. That a little tummy ache, was worried that maybe there was like an echo of the food poisoning. This is not a joke. I, I wish it was a joke. I For dinner, I was like, I don't really feel like cooking. I kind of feel like eating some pizza. I ordered uh, a large Hawaiian pizza, ate literally like six slices, woke up feeling like a million bucks. I had, I had like empty stomach, like my stomach was just like, fill me up more, fill me up even more. And I just kept eating and eating and eating. Then I went to bed, I woke up and, and put down a Peloton ride that was plus 70 kilojoules versus the ride that I put out yesterday. And I was, I think that pizza saved my life, quite frankly. This is the hard reset, dude. I did, I, I like, I, I refilled the damn tank or something like that. Did you see this stuff on Twitter about a company's lentils giving people severe food poisoning? What the hell, man? That's all, I don't think that I, uh, I don't think that I consumed lentils in the week that I got the food poisoning. Like really bad renal failure? What the hell is going on out there? Is this because we defunded the FDA to save uh, 75 cents on everybody's income tax? Is that a knock-on effect? Mozzarella cheese being recalled in British Columbia? What the... Dude, what's going on? Mozzarella recall, BC. Okanagan's choice shredded cheese is being recalled over listeria fears. Okay. I do not... I've never consumed Okanagan's Choice shredded cheese, so I think I'm like in the clear on that one. Also, I don't buy shredded mozzarella, I buy shredded Tex-Mex. But you got me thinking here, Listeria symptoms. Let's just see. Oh, it's the same as every uh, type of foodborne illness. Fever, nausea, cramps, diarrhea, vomiting, headache, constipation, muscle aches. Thanks so much. It couldn't make like a blue warning light appear on the back of your neck or something like that? Anyway, let's. I, I'm okay. It's just the, the pizza saved me. How can you have diarrhea and constipation? This is a very good point. Oh, I can't stop not pooping. Oh, I'm constantly not shitting. I guess it's just you... Actually, now that I think about it, it sounds like a disaster. Because it sounds like you feel like you have to poop at all times, but nothing comes out. Which is a, a classic tragedy. I believe it was in the Epic of Gilgamesh. Here I sit brokenhearted. 
Um, tried the poop, only farted. Hey, Anel, went to a diner, got tricked into spending seven bucks on orange juice. How can I recover? Okay, great starting bit. Thank you so much. We're back with Isaac, and we got a, a very trenchant observation. Hey, Anel, got tricked into buying a $7 orange juice at a diner. Any tips on how to recover? Um, well, don't buy Starbucks for like the next year is the only way. It's going to, you have to amortize out that loss over a very long time scale. Um, but I, I've long said this and I apologize because I know that if you've been around for a while, you've heard it before. Brunch and breakfast juice prices are probably the biggest scam on the planet. They know they've got a captive audience. They know that it's it, like the culture did all the work. Every cereal commercial ever, you have orange juice with your cereal. You got milk with your cereal. You got a glass of water. You got two slices of bread. You got scrambled eggs. You got three breakfast sausages. It, it, the culture has made everybody think you have to drink orange juice for breakfast. So they can charge whatever the hell they want. Uh, at brunch and they know you're gonna pay it because probably the main reason you're at brunch in the first place If it's not for the eggs Benny or the French toast is for the orange juice Especially if you happen to be hung over when you're going to breakfast, you'll pay whatever they ask But I uh, I'm, I've long been a, a water uh, For breakfast sort of guy because nothing disappoints you more than you go to a, a, a diner for breakfast you order an orange juice it's four or five bucks. It's not fresh squeezed. It's just like Tropicana or Simply Orange or whatever. And then it comes in a cup that's like literally this big. It arrives 25 minutes before the food because all they have to do is pour it out of the Tropicana carton. And then there's no free refills because apparently it's, it's precious like liquid gold. Now there is a, there's a caveat here in my personal world. I will gladly pay a premium for freshly squeezed juice because it tastes so much better than the non-freshly squeezed stuff so if you give me the choice between like paying five dollars for tropicana or like eight bucks for a freshly squeezed I'll, i would much rather pay the eight bucks for the freshly squeezed because at least there's like some merit involved with it but otherwise it's it's like the biggest scam in the entire uh, on the entire menu as far as i'm concerned I'd be hard pressed to pay eight bucks for any drink in a restaurant that's not a cocktail. I do have to acknowledge that there, there's like a Canadian American um, exchange difference. What I was gonna say is uh, there's a there's a, if, if you're watching this like 45 percent of my audience, if you're watching this from the United States of America, for restaurant prices you have to add like 25 percent for the U.S. to Canada conversion. And then you also have to add like another 10% on top of that that's irrespective of currency. It's just that, you know, things tend to cost more up here. And then you got to add like another 15% on top of that for the Vancouver tax of, of living in, uh, you know, a, an expensive city. So like an $8 cocktail is something I've not seen in, in a long time. I, th I feel like the average cocktail price that I see on a menu in Vancouver is probably like it's like thirteen seventy-five now. It's getting a little crazy. Maybe, maybe at a happy hour, but I'm I don't tend to be at those establishments between like you know four and six p.m. I don't know if I've mentioned this, but we have a baby. Doctor Manhattan pointing at uh, Rorschach. We have a baby. I would say like eight eight bucks is about what you would expect to pay for either a, a pint of beer or alternatively like a a smoothie. Or uh, like a freshly squeezed cold pressed juice or something like that. Same with DC and NYC. Average drink in a non dive bar is like 15 bucks these days. It is crazy, but I, I mean I understand that it's partly you know inflation, and then it's partly you know the restaurant industry went through the ringer like the last couple of years. But it's got me. I never thought I would become like my grandfather, but I definitely have become my grandfather because I remember there was a in college there was a bar that opened up near campus. And on Tuesday nights, they had $2 beers. It's crazy. Now the, the concept of a $2 beer is unfathomable. Like it, it might actually be below the minimum pricing legally allowable. The economy, folks. The economy? The economy? We still have $2 Tuesdays where I'm at. Honest question. Do you live in the state of Wisconsin? 
I work at a restaurant where the cocktails are 30 bucks. Okay, do you work at an insane cocktail bar where they use one of those like liquid smoke um, machines and the, every cocktail has like 17 egg whites in it and stuff like that? It's made by like a guy who looks like Stanley Tucci. He's got muscular forearms and he's got like a, a really tight roll up on his sleeve and then his forearms are like veiny and busting out of the rolled up sleeve and he's going like or do you work at one of those insane places where a club a, a cocktail is 30 bucks but the catch is it comes with like three hamburgers on a skewer served alongside of the drink you work at Dorzia. Oh, okay that explains it I mean, that's just, that's supply and demand. That's, that's market pricing. Just move to Pennsylvania where Yangling comes out of your tab. Here's, I, I've only been to Pennsylvania. I mean, I've spent like six days total in Pennsylvania. Some of it was in Slippery Rock, Pennsylvania. Some of it was in uh, Pittsburgh and the surrounding suburbs. My question to, to particularly Yinzers in the chat, okay? Yingling is good. So why are you guys drinking so much I see light. You you were blessed, and it's very rare to be blessed with like a, a good macro brewery that's local to where you are. So why are you replacing the Yangling that you're blessed to have in the first place with I see light, which is just like I don't even understand what it's doing there. Yangling is from Philly, I see light is from Pittsburgh. Yeah, but come on, like you guys are more similar than different, right? I mean, only one of you throws batteries at your own NHL players when you're disappointed with their performance. But still, like, apart from that, you you both like to eat at Primanti Bros, right? We threw batteries at Santa Claus once. Philadelphia is so funny. Why is it called the city of brotherly love? That's hilarious. You threw batteries at... It, it, it's actually almost worse. Like, to throw batteries at a real Santa Claus, you would be like, you know, I, I'm re-rolling Eden's soul, by the way, we could do better. If you throw batteries at real Santa Claus, he's like a mythical creature. He could dodge them, he could weather the storm or whatever, you know, he's, he's gonna be fine. He has, like, eldritch powers or whatever, but that, you know that's just a dude in a suit. You're just throwing, you're not throwing batteries at Santa, you're, you're just throwing batteries at, like, a guy. That's just assault. In Philadelphia, a dude also ate horse crap to celebrate the Eagles winning the Super Bowl. Look, unfortunately, let's go. Uh, unfortunately, I am not able to um, criticize the way that any city has reacted to winning or losing a major sporting event. So I, uh, am, I abstain. I recuse myself. I will say I would not eat horse crap. Maybe this is the, the recent poisoning talking. If you were like, if you ate one third of horse crap, the Canucks would guaranteed win the Stanley Cup next year. I wouldn't do it. I would be like, you know what? There's more important things in life. It can't be safe and sanitary. I mean, if, if just to be completely like 100% with you, if you were like, hey, we'll give you the same food poisoning you just had, you'll get over it in like five days but it'll guarantee that the Canucks will win the Stanley Cup, I wouldn't do it. It's just sports. It's okay. I don't... I, it really took it out of me, man. That's why I'm so stunned whenever there's people who, like, actually honor those deals that are like, you know, if the Rangers lose, I'll get uh, Tampa Bay rules tattooed on my ass. And then they actually do it. I'm like, dude, you gotta, like, just delete your account. You gotta run away from that one. It's just, you're really gonna get a tattoo on your ass for the Eastern Conference Finals? It's not even the Stanley Cup Finals. You're doing it for the Eastern Conference Finals? Like, that's... That's too much. I just, I, I shouldn't read the comment, but I'm gonna read it. Commenter said, I'm so happy to have a two-monitor setup, porn on one monitor, NL audio on the other. I don't even know what to say. I feel like that's gonna lead to some... Very confusing, like, knock-on effects in your brain. I'll take it, man. I personally think there should be a, a separation of church and state. He went full Philly? Dude, what? I, 
I'm not insulting Philadelphia, okay? I have nothing wrong with, uh, in my head, I have no preconceived negative notions about Philadelphia except the fact that they uh, threw batteries at that mall Santa Claus or whatever. It's not like they're Minneapolis St. Paul. Completely different situation. They were just snowballs. They weren't batteries. Were they... Was it like, oh, there were, the batteries were inside the snowball, so they were cushions? I do have to tell you, by the way, there's probably some people in the chat who, um, you know, maybe they grew up in an area where it never snows. The media did a, a heck of a propaganda job when depicting how fun a snowball fight is. If you've always had, like, FOMO that you never got to experience a snowball fight, I'm here to tell you, it's, it's not all that. Like, the, a snowball fight, it's it's one of those things It's fun for, like... The, the first time you throw a snowball and you hit somebody with it, you're like, this is fun. The first time you get hit with a snowball and it explodes on... Because the thing is, it hits you, like, in the side of the cheek or something, and that's fine. But then the snow, like, particleizes and it shoots down your winter coat, like under the neckline of your t-shirt, and it gets down your back and stuff like that. You're walking around the rest of the recess like this, like with your shoulders hunched up like this. Or it gets in between your, your snow pants and your boots and stuff like that. And that's even, like, that's the best it ever gets. Because what you always end up with, like, some kid whose dad just got out of, like, federal prison or something like that, who gets off on... Uh, making like an infinity stone snowball like he makes a tiny little snowball in his hand and then just like holds it like this for a minute incredible patience for a, a little kid to have so it becomes like an ice ball then you put a little bit more snow around it so it like it refreezes and then so they're basically just like hucking golf balls at you man hide some gravel inside of it I'm you know, a snowball fight is one of those, th it's fun for like 10 seconds. Plus it's so hard to make the snowballs in like a, a winter glove or a, a mitten. So then you take your gloves off and then you're like, your hands are cold for the rest of the recess. And you're like, well, that's why you're, wear you're supposed to be wearing the gloves, I guess. Oh, dude, don't even get me. So when, when someone would like scoop up a bunch of snow in their hands and then another person would pull back like you're your jacket and shirt, and then they just dump the snow right down your back. Ugh. I still, and this is not like a kids these days bit, but, you know, I, I just think back to like some of those recesses we had in elementary school. It would be like minus 20 outside. We'd go outside for 40 minutes for recess. Begging the teacher, like, please, God, can we stay inside? It's so cold. They say no. And I don't blame them because I'm sure that the teachers, you know, they want their own time to eat their lunch or whatever and just be, like, away from the kids for a little bit. It's kind of crazy. I feel like nowadays it's like a human rights violation. There should be, like, an it, during... When the weather's, like, below minus 10 degrees, they should just put you in the gym with a bunch of board games or something like that. Did you manage recess ever when you taught? No, because I taught at a, a, like a private school in Korea. Kids would just come for like one or two classes and then they would leave. So they, they weren't there for eight hours a day. They didn't need the recess. But I did ad administer a couple uh, field trips. I took, I took kids to uh, a, a local art gallery once. I took kids to like, the, uh, like a science museum once. Honestly, like it gave me a lot of respect for, for teachers. Because as a kid, you don't really get it. But being like one or two teachers and having to look after 30 kids is crazy. No wonder they have us using the damn buddy system and stuff. Like, I, I, I did not get to enjoy the field trip at all. I spent like the whole time just trying to make sure I didn't like lose a, a child. It's okay if you lose one or two. That's the thing, right? You would think like nobody's perfect. So it's like, come on, 30 kids? I lost one, 97% of the kids made it home. 97! No matter where you are, that's an A+. Plus. But oh, the, the parents of the kid who got lost at the science museum and their kid ended up traumatized, they don't see it that way. They get real perturbed about it. Those parents had a 100% loss of their child. No, in the bit, they just had to go to the museum and they just got scared for a while, okay? 
I have, I, I don't think I've ever told this story, but I have an embarrassing story about myself. When I was a, a little kid, I was in Future Shop with my grandpa, and I was like playing, I don't know, Metroid Prime on their GameCube uh, setup or whatever. My grandpa was probably looking at like USB cables, I don't know. 20 minutes go by, I say, okay, you know that little kid anxiety starts to creep in where you're like, uh, where's my family? Where's my family? Um, I started to freak out. I was like, I, it's time to go find my grandpa, right? I walk through the whole future shop, don't see him. Walk through the whole future shop, don't see him. Starting to panic. The more you panic, the less you're able to actually like, you know, search very well because you're just overwhelmed with emotion. Then I went up to the customer service deck. I was like almost in tears or desk, I should say. Um, I was almost in tears and I said, Excuse me, I think I lost my grandpa. Can you make a call for him on the PA to come to the customer service desk? And they did, and he was literally like 10 feet away. But the most embarrassing part of the story is not that he was close, is that I was at the, the age that I was when this story took place, you probably thought I was uh, like five. I was in the damn eighth grade. <laughs> Too, def looking back, definitely too old to be that perturbed at, at having lost my, my grandfather in the future shop. What does that mean for non-North American people? I was like 13. Still just a kid, yeah. And like some kids at 13 are like, you know, living on their own. Some kids at 13 are like, I don't even say swears. But I, I was definitely, I guess I was closer to the second than the first. Yeah, I knew it was kind of a puss move even as an 8th grader, like I was embarrassed with myself, but... It's crazy for me to think of, because like that's where I was when I was 13, and uh... Sometimes you'll, you'll read like a comment on Reddit, that's like, oh, I started drinking when I was 12. And I'm like, you consumed an alcoholic beverage when you were 12 years old? I didn't even eat soup when I was 12. I was such a picky eater. I had my first drink at 13, 15... 11 So the other I guess the the a side of this the the flip side I should say of this story is that I turned 12 or I was like 11 or 12 when the millennium happened when Y2K happened My parents were like you should have a glass of champagne and I like almost called child protective services on them basically I was like you want your 12 year old child to consume champagne I'm 12 I refused they were like, it's a special event. You should like, you know, feel free to, you know, you just have a sip or something like that. And I was like, I will not have a sip. And quite frankly, I'm disappointed in you. But then I, I feel like, again, this is just plus two farming. So I apologize because it feels like it's, it's too easy. But um, North America's like relationship with alcohol is like really bad. Because you're like taught that you should never touch it uh until you're 19 or 21 which is actually like 21 is crazy so what most well i shouldn't say most but what many people end up doing is they spend like you know 20 years with the the mystique surrounding alcohol like oh my god this must be something that's like it, it must be like an elixir of the gods and then when you actually start drinking you make up for lost time and go crazy that's why like there's the college stereotype of the the kid who was never allowed to drink in high school and then like the first year of college they're throwing up like every four days. Not everybody fulfills the stereotype, but but it does happen. Not me, OMG me. There's dozens of us. I still remember my first alcoholic drink. There was a very wealthy foreign exchange student in our dorms in university. And he said, do you want a drink? And I was like, yeah, bro, obviously. Been, been drinking it for years, and then he mixed me, uh, like, Goldschlager and something else and said it's called a Dr. Pepper because it tastes like Dr. Pepper. And then I drank, it was probably like seven liqueurs in a shot glass, and I drank it, and I was like, that's great. That's so good. Let me guess, it did not taste like Dr. Pepper. It did not taste like Dr. Pepper, which is fine, but, like, 19-year-old kids do be doing that stuff. They'll be like... Dude, I, there's all these like weird myths about alcohol. Like the snake bite. It's a strong bows or a Magner cider mixed with a lager in equal parts. It's illegal to serve it at bars in England because it gets you too drunk. 
It's Jägermeister and Goldschlager. It's called Liquid Cocaine. I don't know why I'm doing it like iced tea from Law & Order SVU. Equal parts Goldschlager and Jägermeister. Kids on the street call it Liquid Cocaine. Gets you so high. It's a John Mulaney joke, isn't it? I think I, think I just stole a John Mulaney joke. Jameson and Ginger Ale. Kids these days are calling it a Scotch Bonnet. Already picked up two bodies this morning. It is indeed a John Mulaney joke. Okay, sure. Why are you only doing Isaac runs? Um, because my enjoyment of Isaac is in a very delicate position right now, and I feel like um, the best way to ensure that I have fun and then that uh, hopefully like the audience has fun as well is to just play as Isaac and, and do the, the best that I can do as a result of, of that and just just enjoy the game rather than needlessly putting roadblocks in my way that give me a, a false sense of merit having you know oh look I leave I maybe I lost but at least I lost playing as tainted Samson like who cares man who cares like the whole game is variety to begin with who cares about the character man no thank you you think Eden runs are too much Zane well, you have to consider what Zane is, you know? Is Zane, um, like, I'll take things that are not necessarily objectively good, but as a result of that, like, we get some entertainment value out of it? Because that's how I always thought Zane is. And then it turns out that, like, based on the way that the game was rebalanced for Repentance, Zane is when you get no damage, no tears, and no HP, but you have like a familiar that goes wow wow wee wah every time you get hit. You you get like little Borat or something like that. I told you I don't want this. That sounds fun. Yeah, that's the that's the textbook definition of Zane uh now for whatever reason. Hey Anel, at the grocery store, do you bag your own groceries or wait for the cashier to do it? It's a great question. I'm not afraid to say that like I honestly, I, I don't believe in many conspiracy theories, or any maybe, but I do think that somewhere down the road, or down the line, grocery stores used bringing your own canvas bags to the grocery store as a way to no longer have the grocery store bag the stuff for you. It's nice to bring your own reusable bags, but if you weren't alive in the 90s, here's what a grocery store experience was like, okay? You put your stuff on the conveyor belt, it gets scanned. You oftentimes, there was a person at the end of the conveyor belt that worked at the grocery store that bagged the stuff up for you. And I know you're gonna say, oh, uh, big man needs to uh, have someone bag his own groceries. I can bag my own groceries. It's just gonna slow down the damn throughput for the lineup of people behind me. Cause I gotta also put the shit on the conveyor belt and then I also gotta pay and then I gotta wait till the card reader says approved and then I gotta put my card back in my wallet, my wallet back in my pocket and then I gotta go to the end of the conveyor belt and start packing up this stuff myself. So you're actually gonna serve customers more slowly than if you had somebody like helping out at the back. But anyway, at some point we started bringing reusable bags. You hand your bag to the cashier, the cashier bags it up um, while you're paying. That was not so bad. I didn't really mind that. Then I remember, and, and I mean, you got to be careful with your COVID rants, don't get me wrong, but I remember, it's probably like May 2020, I went to the grocery store with my reusable bag, and I put my reusable bag on the end of the conveyor belt in order to, you know, you want it to be standing up nicely so you can just put your own stuff in the bag as quickly as possible. And then the cashier, like, scolded me and said, Sir, thanks to COVID, it's against store policy to let your, to let people who bring their bags from home put their bag on the counter. Like, with that, we were at peak hysteria. Like, it, it was, even when, when I was at peak hysteria as well, I was like, you know, that doesn't make any fucking sense. Like, not to be rude, but you think the bottom of my bag has COVID on it? It just, I, I guess maybe there's not an, an appeal to reason, but still. And then I'm, my, my bag is going to give COVID to the counter. And then somebody's going to lick 
the counter and then they're gonna get COVID or I don't understand. But anyway, and then they just never brought it back. So, and I'm, I'm not knocking the cashiers, you know, they got, it's, it, they, were, they were frontline heroes, you know, during the lockdown. Nowadays, the way that it seems to go is they say, how will you pay? And I say on card. And then they look up at the lights of the grocery store well, I frantically bag my own shit as haphazardly and quickly as possible so that I don't feel like I'm being watched by the 25 people in line behind me who are all going, ha, ha. I miss the dedicated bagger, man. You woke up my hamster? You gotta put on Bluetooth headphones, man. As a cashier of seven years, I love those moments. Like I said, I'm not mad at you. I mean, I don't really think that the cashier should have to bag the groceries. I think there should be a dedicated bagger. It's just the, it's the superior system. Like, why are we paying? It's, it's not like we're paying less for groceries because there's no bagger. Have you looked at your grocery bill lately? It's crazy. I know I'm t I, I'm on to you, Daryl from Save On Foods. Daryl, spending all your money on Save On Foods, million dollars, score and win. If a Vancouver Canucks player scores nine goals in a single game, you'll win a million dollars. Hey, Daryl, how about you stop financing this nonsense and you start having someone staff the bakery so I don't have to stand at the bakery with my thumb on my ass for like 20 minutes waiting for somebody to uh show up so i can be like yes i'll take two hamburger buns please how about you just hire some people daryl save on is overrated come on i don't know anybody on earth who likes save on foods you just you know you kind of tolerate it people like the real canadian superstore people like you know some of the stuff at whole foods despite the price nobody's like oh i'm so excited to go to save on it's just like that's where you go when it's it's the closest grocery store to your house where, like, a loaf of bread is not $20. Costco. Should people love going to Costco. I don't think anybody's excited to go to Save On Foods. Save On charges you extra for not giving them your data. It's actually true. It's 100% correct. Um, I know it sounds more insidious when you put it that way than what they would place it as or what they would describe it as. But basically, if you go to a Save On Foods, prices will be listed as like um, member price and it'll it's very tempting because the member price is oftentimes like 30% less than the, the non-member price. But in order to get the member price, you basically have to give them, you know, your, your phone number and your email address and be advertised to and et cetera, et cetera. I hate to say it because I, I mean, I'm a member as well. The juice is worth the squeeze. You do also get to um, you get to collect save on points. But I'm here to tell you. So I, I've been using my save on more rewards cards since 2015. So we think about five years of grocery shopping. The net gain I've gotten out of more reward points. I've probably gotten, I would say like five eight packs of sparkling water and a couple of loaves of bread. So you're, we're, we're talking about, I don't know, like less than $10 a year in, in actual rewards for having this card. I did buy that lady bread once accidentally. Not bad. You're actually like hail corporate. That's terrible. That's probably like 0.1% cash back. What do you mean not bad? It's not bad. It's awful. It's terrible. Your food data ain't worth that much? Bro, are you Daryl? I don't understand. You, you want me to get down on my hands and knees and, and thank Daryl for giving me one case of blackberry sparkling bubbly over the course of eight years? I'd rather die. By the way, Daryl, just hire some more cashiers. Maybe the lineups at your damn store wouldn't be so long if you just hired like, you know, two more people. I just don't understand all the people that are like, Look, I have nothing but respect for the grocery store workers, and I have nothing but contempt for the grocery store owners. Don't even get me started on Galen Weston, man. Ten years of, of oligopolic collusion to fix the price of bread in Canada, to raise uh, Loblaws' uh, profit margins, class action lawsuit between them and the Canadian citizenry, total settlement, $20 gift card for anybody affected over the course of... 12 years of bread price fixing is comical, man. Get owned by the bread mafia. Bimbo International. Honestly, there should be like a button you hit like on Twitter, on any form of social media that just filters America out. Did you see the tweet that was like, the internet's broken, 
There's no reason I should know the names of 75 American congressmen when I live in Amsterdam. Like, there, there needs to... Be, and I, I apologize to the United States citizenry that's watching this. Again, you're the plurality of the, of the viewing audience. You don't understand that as a result of your hegemony, the whole world basically becomes the United States of America. There really just, like, there should be light mode, dark mode, and then, like, no America for a bit mode. You should be able to, like, hit a button, and then any American tweets get filtered for, like, just 24 hours. And then I, you, a lot of people are saying based, but also, if you ever find yourself on the West Coast waking up at, like, 5.30 a.m., you realize that, like, overnight Twitter is just American Twitter but with British people instead. I also should not know that many, like, British councillors and, and members of parliament and stuff like that. In a just world, I would have no idea who uh, Jacob Rees Moog is. I should not know. I, sh I should... One in eight people in Canada should know the name of the British Prime Minister. There needs to be like a... There needs to be a button that's like, just turn this off. Just for a day. I'm not saying Americans shouldn't be able to tweet. There should just... You should be able to like, shield yourself for a day. Drop the left hand. Ancient meme, and yet also so true. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it's Moogan time. Apparently it's Jacob Rees Mogg. I'd like to apologize. But again, there's no reason that I should know that. I don't, I think Quince is okay, but whatever. Don't worry, Elon's gonna save Twitter. I'm looking forward to it. I think he's got a lot of good ideas. What is, what's the first, the edit button, right? I don't see how that could possibly go wrong. I'm, I'm very staunchly against the edit button on Twitter. I'm not saying there's no way to fix this problem, but the way that I see it working is that somebody makes a tweet that's like, I like pizza. And then thousands of people favorite it, retweet it, reply, and go like, I also love this, I agree! And then the original poster edits the tweet to say like, I love murder. And then everybody that replied, all of a sudden, it looks like they have a, a permanent record on their uh, Twitter account of liking murder publicly. But also, I just think that like, we should accept that like, typos are gonna happen, man. Who cares about a... Like, it, does it seem a little archaic to have to delete a tweet and repost it because there's a typo? Yeah. Okay, so just leave, the tw just leave the tweet up there. Who cares? It's just Twitter. On Tumblr, you used to be able to edit other people's posts. Now that's a choice. That's an idea. Kofefi. So true. I can't wait for the 10-part Netflix series on Kofefi. I don't understand why people don't just read their tweets before they post them. I mean, you can proofread something like 10 times. You could still have like a, you know, like a double word or use the wrong there or something like that. Also, like, I, I think it just flies in the face of what I want Twitter to be, which is just like, I had a stupid thought. For example, you ever see a capital S smart car doing some capital D dumb shit? Don't even, do. I know we're pausing immediately here. The, the impetus for that tweet, by the way, was there's a lot of construction going on in Vancouver right now, which is fine. I understand it. I, I know everybody complains about it. But there's one section, okay, where a, there's a bridge that terminates into a road. And then there's a merging lane that is a turn on right at where the bridge ends. Okay? I'm on the merging lane. Right in front of me is a smart car. As soon as they get to the like midway through, not even midway through the merge lane. As soon as they get to the end of the turn, they slam on the brakes in their smart car, turn on their left signal light, and just wait for a spot to open up to get into the bridge lane. Meanwhile, like you got, there's a zipper merge, okay? You get to the end of the merge lane, and then they let you in, and then the person behind you moves up to the end, and then the car goes, and then they get in in the next, it's called the zipper merge. Instead, they were holding like 20 people up behind them, because they're like, I have to, I have to get into this lane right now. That was the, that was the impetus. You ever see a smart car doing some dumb shit behind the, VH1 behind the tweet? Imagine if you didn't need a car in general. Oh my god, just shut up. <laughs> Like, I get, look, and this is coming from a position of mutual respect. Anytime anyone, like, if someone's like, oh, I saw a bad driver today, 
The proper response is not like, well, cars shouldn't exist anyway. Like, I get it. You're online, okay? I don't even necessarily disagree, but like, let's talk about where things exist in reality instead of like how they would be if you were Romulus and Remus and we're like building Western society from the ground up in 2022 with all the information you have available from the previous 10,000 years of history, you know? Most people, I guess I shouldn't say most people because again, I don't live in the United States, but they agree with you. They just want you to like be quiet a little bit. They're like, yes, I also am not like a huge fan of cars, but at the same time, I have to go to work. Take the train. Okay, then go ahead and say it. There's no train. Okay. Well, then you should spend the rest of your life petitioning city council uh, to build a train while an endless parade of like 80 year old NIMBYs refuse to pay higher property taxes for anything, even though they're grandfathered in at the lowest rate of all time. Why not, dude? Why not? It's like, oh, you drive a car? Oh, why don't you just dedicate like every second of your life to uh, changing the system? It's because Survivor's on, okay? You gotta live a balanced life. That sounds like a you issue. It's not a you issue at all. I just drive my car. <laughs> it sounds like a you issue. You're so mad that I'm driving my car. I'm just trying to pick up my damn kid from daycare. I got no problem. I'm jamming out. I'm, I'm in my car, you know. Like, look, was I mad that they were clogging up the merge lane? Yes. But what was I outwardly doing? I was going, singing on the fever street. I want to love a guy like Columbia. I couldn't say to go heaven or Las Vegas. Like I was, I was zooming, dude. I was having a good time. Plus, don't forget, okay, I'm based. I don't respect the policy of, of people being grandfathered in. I think it leads to a two-tier system of, of privileges. When we, uh, I've, I've told this story a few times before. In Ontario, this is not the case, but in British Columbia, landlords can legally make a place not except pets. In Ontario, they can say no pets, but if you get a pet, they can't evict you because it's like a human rights issue. In BC, they can be like, well, it said no pets. So, you know, are you going to move or are you going to give up your best friend? Which I think is uh, terrible. Anyway, so in we, we lived uh, in an apartment building that was pretty old. And uh, we were told that there were no pets but there were two old ladies on our floor who had cats. So we asked about it and then our landlord was like, oh, they're grandfathered in. Then Kate wanted a cat. So we got two fucking cats. Cause honestly, like kind of like, fuck you. If other people, oh, the whole building is pet free except for 25% of the tenants. Okay, well, guess what? Like, I, I guess it's controversial. I believe all people should be treated equally. So we're gonna buy a pet then. And then, um, when we moved out, the landlord said, by the way, do you guys have cats? There's a lot of pet hair in the apartment. Uh, and then I said, oh yeah, we have two cats. And our landlord said, oh, pets aren't allowed in the unit. And I said, oh no. Well, anyway, and, uh, and we would we were already in the process of moving out and i got i tell this story at least like once every three months because it feels good and i'm proud of myself that is what we in the business call civil disobedience we stood up to what i feel is an unjust policy got a witty little own out of it and and faced zero consequences did you get your deposit back we did honestly the only time i've ever lost part of my security deposit was insane it was when we moved out of our last place into this house and uh, we had lived in the apartment for like four years, something like that, four and a half years. And uh, first off, when we gave our landlord uh, 60 days notice that we were moving out, she started asking us if we could show the apartment to other people because she was on holiday in China at the time. And we were like, yeah, we're not gonna do, like that's honestly, you shouldn't even be able to ask that. That's an asinine question. And then she was like, okay, okay, sorry. And so eventually like she started showing the place off when she came back and you know, because the rental mar market has always been insane in Vancouver, like they got interest in it really quickly. She came through to do like her once over and she was crazy. She opened up the oven and was like, oh, there's like some grease on the bottom of the oven would you be willing to clean that for me and i just told i was like you know we were in the process of moving at the time i was like i'm not that seems to me to be like a reasonable level of of dirt given the circumstances so like i'm not gonna do that 
And then she said, that's fine. We can just negotiate like taking part of your deposit out. And I was like, okay, fine. So I think at the end of the day, we got like $200 dinged off of our deposit because uh, for an oven cleaning fee. I was like, all right, whatever, whatever makes you feel better. But hey, there's a, there is a catch. I do want to, this is a great synergy here. I was so worried before the walkthrough because uh, in my office, I had put up acoustic foam, right? But I had put it up with like this insanely sticky, like binding tape. When I ripped it off, it left a ton of foam on the wall. It ripped off so much paint and it ripped off so much drywall. But I did, I, I went to the Home Depot, I color matched the paint, repainted the wall, uh, and it, it looked like shit. It looked like garbage. I was sure that she was going to be like, we're not going to, we're not going to give you your deposit back. She went ape shit on the oven, was like, this is unacceptable. Charged me 200 bucks for an oven cleaning fee, even though it just looked normal. Um, walked into my office and went, well, it looks good. And then walked out. So I basically considered it like as a, a fair price to pay ways to cheat your landlord. I mean, I always try to like, I'm not as, at least five years ago, I was not as anti-landlord as everybody in chat is now. I was mostly just the guy living my life, okay? But the more I think back, the more I'm like, almost every landlord I had really did do less than nothing. That's, and again, I know this sounds like I'm like a horrible tenant. I swear to you, it's not the case. But I'm so old that in the same place we, we lived in where we got cats, because there were people on our floor that had grandfathered into the, the pet policy. Um, we, again, this is due to my own age. We paid rent by sliding a check through a mail slot uh, into an office door at the, in the ground level of this building, right? So we'd been living there for like seven months and we'd always paid rent on time. One day I was on the toilet and I got a phone call from my landlord that was like, hey, just so you know, we, we're going to have to begin eviction proceedings. And I said, um, why? And she said, well, you, get, you guys didn't pay rent this month. And I, it was the second of like July. And I was like, oh, I'll just go down and do that right now. And she said, oh, you're planning on paying? And I said, yeah, sorry. Uh, I'm not going to say her name, but I was like, yeah, sorry. I just forgot. And she was like, oh, okay, that's fine. Because really, like, if you do it again, we'll have no choice but to evict you. And I was like, just chill, lady. It's good. I forgot for a day. I, I understand that you have to do it. Don't get me wrong. But like, things happen, you know, people, people get busy. She was kind of power tripping, for sure. I, and that's why, like, you know, I don't feel too bad about breaking the, breaking the terms of the lease and getting a pet because honestly, like, she's kind of a scumbag. <laughs> Dude, even like, I don't know, I, I respect BC Hydro, like the electrical company in BC. They send you like 60 days before your electric bill is due. They send you um, a, a bill. And then like a week before it's due, they send you a, an email that's like, excuse me, uh, to whom it may concern, this is just a polite reminder. You may have forgotten, but your uh, electric bill is due in five days, which is beautiful because there have been times where I get the email and I'm like, I'm going to pay my electric bill. And then I just forget. And then I get another email like 40 days later that's like, Hey, make sure you're not late on your electric bill. Most sane hydro company in Canada, maybe. And then on the other side, there's my landlord. I was uh, eight hours late paying rent. And she was like, hey, to whom it may concern, uh, rather than give you like a courtesy phone call and be like, hey, can you pay your rent this month? I'm going to engage in eviction proceedings, which just seems like insane to me because I'm pretty sure legally speaking, once you issue like an eviction notice, it takes like 60 days to actually get a court order to kick them out of the house or something like that. Like it's just so overkill for no reason. Anyway, she's just a little bit crazy. I, now I'm realizing I have a, uh, I have more, I, I had, re, I, I didn't realize I fell in love with my chains when I was a tenant. Because I had previously said like most of my landlords are pretty good. 
Um, but now I'm realizing when I first moved to Vancouver, I lived in a, a converted garage, like pseudo basement illegal suite with Kate. And uh, like the month after I moved in, the landlord was like, hey, this was only supposed to be for one unit. So you guys are really racking up the utility costs. I'm going to need to charge you like an extra $100 a month for utilities or something like that. And I was like, I don't think my like one shower a day is... Uh, is is 300 worth uh 100 a month but you know you kind of got me in a captive audience here also they had teenage kids and one time um i was expecting again because i'm old i was expecting a hard copy xbox 360 review game coming in the mail uh and it never came and i was like that's weird because they said they sent it out and then a couple of weeks later, the landlord's wife was like, Hey, we found this game in our kid's uh, bookshelf. He said he thought it was for him and he bought it, but actually I'm pretty sure that it's yours. And it was like, one of, I don't know if anybody has ever received one of these, but it was not like an EB Games Xbox 360 cover. It was like one of those ones that's like black and white, in text on the cover, it was like, for review purposes, not for resale, not for resale, not for resale, etc, etc. So, um, you know, just the casual, like, lying about utility costs and also maybe committing a little bit of mail theft. Gotta respect the kid for the hustle. I mean, honestly, I feel bad for him because I'm pretty sure it was like Resident Evil Revelations. So, if anything, like, honestly, we should have just left it there. He saved me. And then the place we moved to after that was the one with the insane landlord who threatened to evict us. Um, when I was eight hours late paying the rent completely by accident and had been like a model tenant up to that point. And then the one after that was actually really great except for the walkthrough at the end and the insane ask to uh to show our apartment to other people like we're a real estate agent like you're already getting paid for doing nothing can you just do the nothing i do have like i, I would say we have like one good landlord the first landlord i had in college we we were seven 19 year olds living in a house on campus we left the house in a state of disarray um, and he gave us all of our deposits back and was on like very friendly terms with us. And I, I really just, I, I look back at that and I'm like, A, he didn't have to do that. But B, sanest landlord on earth, recognized that he was getting paid like an insane amount of money. He was getting paid seven rents for this shitty house. He probably walked in when we moved out and it was a little bit fucked up. And he said, what did I expect? And then he paid somebody to come through and clean it and then uh, rented it out to someplace else for like, or to somebody else for like 8% higher. That's, I, I still respect him to this day. I love watching Dan get one hit in phase two. Well, like, I, again, Dan can do whatever he wants in the Melania fight. I saw him make it to phase two today. He, so he barely makes it out of phase one, right? And then he starts acting, because there's like a 50 second cutscene between phase one and phase two. He pulls out a, a pad of paper, starts scribbling on it with a, like a marker, shows what he drew to the chat, takes a huge glug on his insanely large water bottle. He's like completely out of the mindset you need to be in by the time, it, uh, by the, time the game comes back. Like the, the, the one I was able to watch this morning, he did that during the cutscene. And as a result of doing that, he forgot that he got hit just before the cutscene, and then he got one-tapped immediately in phase two. And he was like, how did that happen? And everybody in chat was like, oh, you got hit right before you, you started the fight. I mean, it's a hard fight to begin with. You don't have to, like, you know, make it that much harder on yourself. I feel like at least I never had a, a truly insane landlord. I'm thankful for that. My landlord's just a dude, can't really complain. That's the dream for sure. What would an insane landlord do? I mean, I just be up in your business. Like um, not give you 24 hours notice and, and try to come into your unit uh, way more frequently than is actually necessary. Or, I mean, there's a, at the school that I went to and, and probably a lot of schools, there are some landlords that put like truly insane things in the leases. Like, there's a, an infamous landlord in my hometown uh, that will write things into leases, like she'll only rent to female tenants. And then in the lease, there'll be like some subconditions that are like no male guests, no more than one guest uh, per tenant. 
no guests uh, at all allowed after like 10 p.m. and stuff like that. So we were actually like when we were in the dorms and we were looking for houses, they did like a workshop on stuff to look out for. And they were like, none of this stuff is actually like legal. But at the same time, like you should probably just avoid renting with this person. Because I don't, again, you know, the rules of, of law, the wheels of, of justice move slowly. Is she renting a nunnery? Well, I think that was kind of like her dream. My landlord's daughter once offered me chocolate cake and milk, which was nice, but she never fixes my damn door. Dude, that's what gets me like at one of the houses that I lived in when I was a student. Like every time we signed the lease, the landlord would make us uh, a homemade cake and bring it over and we would like all eat a slice together like some weird like funny games sort of torture but they were so slow when it came to actually fixing anything we're like oh there's some mold in the basement like crickets as soon as we signed the lease is like here's she's back with another cake shit is crazy man it's like Spider-Man 2. Wait a minute, did you Spider-Man 2 me now that I think about it? There's a nice landlord's daughter in Spider-Man 2. I don't know if she brought him a cake though. I feel like she brings him some sausages. Was that Lauren Lapkus? I'm like, I'm reverse engineering it in my brain right now. No, Lauren Lapkus, she'd be too young to be that age in Spider-Man 2. It's cookies, okay. You guys want some cookies? I'm gonna rent my first apartment for university this year and this is very disheartening. I mean, it's just how it is, like, you know, it's not like during the times where I was renting, like I was miserable every day. It was just like, you know, once every few months you'd have a story where you'd be like, I don't really like the person I'm like renting my house from. It's not all horrible. I will say though, and I, I again, you're going to accuse me of just farming base. Part of this is because I live in a new place, so I, I don't deal with it as much. But homeowners are like so whiny about how hard it is to own a house. It's so annoying. And I worried that I would like become one of those people when we bought a house, but it's not the case like at all. There's anytime there's an article that's like the rent has gone up 40% year over year. There's always like some 72 year old lady in the comments is like, well, I had to get a new roof this year. And you're like, okay, at least you own your house. I don't know what you want people to say. Like, yeah, everything costs money, Doreen. Most, I, I don't think that the average homeowner real well i shouldn't say that I sh the doreens of the world i feel like uh they don't realize that like if your roof breaks and you're a homeowner you pay for the roof and then it's baked into the cost of like selling your house in the future if you're a tenant and your roof breaks your landlord is going to largely drag their heels for weeks or months before they actually get it fixed and then they're not going to get it fixed with like an accredited roofing agency there will just be like one guy that they've known for 20 years who does all their handiwork he does all the electrical he does all the plumbing he does all the roofing even though he's not really like adept at any of them he just sort of like he's just sort of handy like it's actually like so easy to own a house i have to cut two checks a year for property tax we're already like 10 checks down well i mean i guess the mortgage comes out the, technically that's a check but it's more of like a direct debit but this is way too real just shut up you this uh, homeowner spotted Homeowners are always like trying to steal valor. Oh, my washing machine broke. Okay, the price of your house has gone up 35% in the last 24 months. Like people, you, you can't expect people to be sympathetic. It's going down now. Yeah, but as it's going down now, it had gone up so much in the past and rent's going up to begin with. You can, the homeowner, you, you, you can't complain about owning a home in a world of renters, okay? It's just like, uh, it's just a bad look. Turning into Bernie. The homeowners complain too much, it's annoying. I wish they would not complain about a privilege that they willfully entered into. Especially like it bothered me in Vancouver because they were going to raise property taxes on homes valued to be over $3 million in order to like um, build more schools, which is something that's in dire need in the city. Obviously, I have a little bias there. I would always ride my bike on the seawall and then like every house in point gray which is like a very wealthy neighborhood in vancouver would have this garish huge like orange billboard in front of it, it would be like please stop the communist school tax like we are senior citizens on fixed income 
uh, with that just happened to have a view of the Pacific Ocean and a house that uh, we bought for $180,000 in the 80s that's now worth like five or six million dollars. And also, uh, if you, you can go Google this and fact check me, but Vancouver has like the cheapest property taxes in Canada or the United States. Uh, on a on a percentage of assessed value basis like it's just you're, you you ruined your house with the billboard and i still have no sympathy it would always make me so mad when i when i rode my bike by california's at one percent dude honestly i'm hold on i'm doing my math right now i genuinely think that vancouver's property tax is point like 0.3% of your property's assessed value twice annually. So 0.6 in aggregate. And people still complain nonstop. Delaware's 0.58. I mean, well, we're competing with Delaware, which is where like every tech company moves in order to never pay tax ever again. It's 0.05% it's biannually. It's crazy, man. Which is awesome for me, but if they were like, you know, hey, we're gonna like raise the property tax a little bit to fund the school, I would be like, you know what, that seems fair. I like, uh, I like living in a city where people are happy and not stressed out. I have a child, okay? I got strong opinions on like Peppa Pig, and honestly, I'm pretty stoked because my daughter has started watching a lot of the Magic School Bus. And, you know, it's one of those, it's nice to be able to share with her the things that I watched when I was a child. Magic School Bus is pretty sick, too. I think that th this is too millennial of a bit for me to be happy saying, but they did not have to go that hard on the Magic School Bus theme song. Like, they, they must have hired, like, an ex-soul singer or something like that for that. Cruising off down Main Street, we're relaxed and feeling good. And they got all the ad-libs in the background. Step on in and don't be shy, come on. Just to make your day complete, you might get baked into a pie on the magic school bus. Walk the river of lava. Like, the, it's only like 31 seconds long. But they, they go hard. Also, I didn't realize, like, okay, everybody remembers, if you watched it as a, as a child, at least you remember, that in the first episode, Arnold effing dies I guess we didn't need to do that we could have just walked around um, but also in the second episode they go inside of his body without even asking him literally the first episode he freezes his head into an ice ball on Pluto in the second episode he's just like he's scared to go on a field trip because he fucking died on the first field trip so they, Miss Frizzle goes, don't worry, just stay at the school and keep my lizard company, which is an insane thing to say for a teacher in the first place. Then he's just like eating uh, cheese puffs. Miss Frizzle shrinks the magic school bus down to the size of like a single red blood cell and flies into his mouth so that you can uh, learn about how the digestive system works. Like that kid honestly needs to talk to the ACLU. Spoiler tag much? Spoiler tag. You've gotten so much better at singing. Oh, thank you. I've been doing a lot of it, um, you know, to try to get my daughter to fall asleep. Heavily inspired by Charlie Puth's rendition of uh, Sing from Sesame Street. Paid commenter. Someone said that. Don't say no one said that. Someone said that. Malf said he's a better singer than you. Look. We're, Mouth and I are both horrible singers. But I give myself the edge because I know the words. Like, I, and I've been to karaoke with, with this guy a few times. Neither of us have any pitch, but at least I know the words and like when they're said. I want to reiterate, both really, really bad. Like if we're talking NLSS karaoke, Apollo is an amazing singer. Rob is a very good singer. Me, Dan, and, and Malf are all around the same level, I would say. <laughs> Bear, I don't know. I've, I've, I don't think I've ever heard Bear sing, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if he's a good singer. 
It makes sense to me that Sinvicta would be good at karaoke as well. But like, Rob is a great singer and Apollo is a really, really good singer. Like both of them, they're like the stars of karaoke whenever we went. Chibli, I'm, it's not your fault, but I'm mad at you, okay? Because I feel like you're giving America and Americans way too much credit. When you made that tweet that said, this is for satirical purposes, but I'm never leaving America again, I'm having the best time. You have to play hard. I understand that you're over there in Oceania. You don't understand the politics of North America. You have to play hardball with Americans sometimes. Because otherwise, they will play hardball with you. Americans will legit be like, Oh, you have to come visit me because I don't have a passport. Okay, then get a passport. You don't understand. It's so much harder to get a passport in America for some reason that doesn't make any sense. It's the easiest country in the world to travel to and from, but for some reason, it's impossible for me to manifest the idea in my head of what it would be like to possess a document allowing me to freely leave my own country. You gotta play hardball, man. Next time, you have to... Rather than being like, I'm coming back to Texas, you have to be like, you guys come to Wellington, or Auckland, or like Dunedin, or Christchurch, or wherever. I don't know where you live, honestly. Do you live in Hobart, Tasmania? To get a passport, I had to drive three hours from LA to San Diego and pay $300 just to get to Vancouver. This is what I mean when I say that Americans are like, you don't understand how hard it is for me. That's probably a little bit worse than the average passport experience, but it is not that atypical, man. Like a, a 10 year passport in Canada is like 160 bucks. The lines are insane right now. There was a viral story about like uh, a woman who, she right now, if you want to go to the passport office to get your passport, you have to line up at like 2 a.m. They stop taking people at like 5 a.m. Um, so instead she just bought a plane ticket to go to Edmonton. And then there was like an $80 plane ticket, 110 bucks or 160 bucks for her passport and 110 bucks for next day service. See, this is a very similar story to what you're talking about right here. I'm not saying the system is good, just for the record. <laughs> the system is bad. <laughs> no, they have like crazy backups right now. Like normally when I had to get my passport, I don't know, like renewed, must have been 2013 or something like that. I just had to go to the office and be like, you know, there was not that bad of a lineup. I waited for like an hour and then I was like, I need to renew my passport. And they were like, okay, give me... Well, they, they always say, do you want a five-year passport or a 10-year passport? And I'm like, hmm, that's a tough one. How about a 10-year uh, passport so I don't have to do this shit immediately? Uh, again, in five years? Anyway. That, that system worked fine for me, but apparently there's like a huge backup now. Probably because people let it lapse over COVID, which makes a lot of sense. Probably because people are traveling more now than they did over the past few years. Do you use Nexus? Uh, I used Nexus until uh, I got ragged on by the border agent because my one-year-old infant didn't have Nexus and I had the audacity to drive into the Nexus line. And he uh, asked if I would feel better if we went inside the secondary, if that would make my day better, and I said no. Anyway, so now we have to take our uh, two-year-old infant to a Nexus interview with a U.S. border agent somewhere, uh, where I guess they're gonna interrogate her and make sure she's not stealing a job from a U.S. citizen or something like that. So for now, we just drive through the, uh, the normal side of the border. I, I don't want to complain though. Last time we crossed the border, it was actually very easy. We finally had like a the world's most sane border guard and uh, she was like, where are you going? And I said the name of the city. She said, why? I said to visit my wife's family. And then she said, any alcohol or tobacco in the car? And I said, no. And then she said, have a nice day. And I was like, yo, I didn't know this is like a vision of what it could be like. That was like when I was at Subway uh, and well, my sandwich was being toasted instead of me and the sandwich artist just awkwardly looking at each other. Uh, she said, how's your day going so far? I was like, what? You can say that? This is a vision of what customer service could be like in a, in a utopia? And I said, it's pretty good. How about you? And she said, yeah, good. And I was like, whoa, dude, this is crazy. 
No, I didn't get fined when we went into the Nexus line, even though our baby didn't have a Nexus. The dude really just was having like a power trip. I know, I, I, we got a lot of recycled stories, so I apologize, but again, having a life that you actually like enjoy in your home country is like the ultimate anti-anxiety medication. Because he was going in. He was saying stuff like, uh, are you taking this seriously? And I said, yeah, I'm taking this seriously. And he was like, well, it seems like you don't really care. And I was like, well, I do care. I guess I, I didn't say this next part, but in my head, I was like, I apologize for having a deep voice. I apologize for not like, I don't know, crying because I made an administrative mistake or whatever. And then he was like, well, like, you know, I could turn you around at the border and send you home. And I was in my head again, like outwardly, I was like, please don't. But inwardly, I was like, oh no, send me back to my fucking house with my family. Do I need a lawyer? Like, it's literally, it's like a 45 minute drive away. What do you want me to do? Please, sir, please let me get into Blaine, Washington so I can buy some Tillamook cheddar cheese. Please, please. Just relax, dude. Did you have bigger problems? You watch the news lately? My baby doesn't have a nexus. That's fine. You know, you, there's a way that you could be like, you know, hey, just for future reference, don't use this line unless everybody in the car has a nexus. That's a reasonable statement that would make me feel embarrassed that I didn't think about that and thought that my baby was an exception because the concept of interviewing a two-year-old toddler to see if they can get a nexus pass is ridiculous to me. It, but to, when you go in like so over the top like that, it's just like, I mean, you, you're just going, you're not even doing the Bond cop. You're just doing the bad cop. Nexus is like TSA pre-check for Canada and the US. So like, basically, it's uh, it creates a two-tier system of citizenry where if you pay $100, you can get into a shorter line when you cross the border and save yourself like half an hour a trip. Kind of like a Disney Fast Pass. I know you guys are a big fan of that. Private roads. Well, I would. It, it's also. I mean, I hate to say it, but it is amazing at the airport. Like, sometimes you get at the airport, there's like a 250 person line for security. Then you flash your Nexus card and they take you to like a private lane. It's not even like an exclusive thing. Like, anybody can get it. I, well, I, I don't know. I guess like anybody without a criminal record can get it, but. Like, they make you feel like you're you're so exclusive. There's no minimum age for the Nexus. Yeah, I know, he's crazy. And, like, the I just... I, I understand that they're trained to be assholes because they, uh... I don't know, are trying to, like, root out drug traffickers or human traffickers and stuff like that. I feel like it's a very reasonable thing to assume that a, a four-month-old infant wouldn't need a Nexus. Because you had, it requires an interview at a at an in-person facility. It's crazy. You, what, you got a, like a little baby that can't even talk. They also deal with the same mistakes all the time. Well, I'm sure that's hard for them. Won't, won't somebody think of the border agent? Maybe that's not what you meant, but that's the way I chose to take it. So is your baby going to do the interview? Well, when they oh, like they they were closed for like two years because of COVID and they couldn't even do the Nexus interviews unless you like flew to Montreal. But you know, again, maybe it's good that I'm not like a, a in a position of power as a world leader. Because I said it before, like I feel like rather than um, rather than border agents being assholes to nice people in order to ensure that they catch like the one out of 10,000 people that are trying to smuggle cocaine across the border or whatever. We should run the risk of the opposite, border agents being nice to everybody and accidentally being too nice to the drug traffickers. Because I'm just saying this, like... They're real hard asses at the border, for what I assume are largely, you know, drug and smuggling based reasons. People are still, they're like doing more drugs than ever. I think you might be kind of like ass at your job, so can you at least like, be nice? <laughs> I'm sorry. But like whatever, the, the current system that you're using is not working to the standards that I, I think it would have to work to in order to justify me being 
condescended to every time I try to bring some tourism dollars to your nation. It's just madness. I'm not asking, oh, Mr. Letourneau, welcome back to the United States of America. May I interest you in a sale at the premium outlets? But, like, just be, like, personable and, like, civil at least or whatever. Canada border agents were super rude. Dude, yeah, we. you can also, I'm not even making this, like, a US v. Canada thing. I had the same thing. There's a lot of, like, I, I've had some very annoying experiences with Canadian border agents. But I think the older I get, like, the more I realize that, like, at least with the Canadian border agents, like, without being too rude, what are they going to do? Unless you broke the law, like, you're a citizen. I, I mean, I, I'm a citizen, I should say. So I, I, maybe it's flipped if you're, if you're American. But whenever, like, the Canadian border agents are kind of, like, you know, short with me, in my head, I always just remind myself, is like, we both know you're going to let me in. I'm a citizen. You, you legally can't not let me in. They can arrest you for stupid answers. Those charges won't stick. They could ruin a, they could ruin a day or... And I, again, this, maybe this is coming from a place of, of privilege. Um, but I have reached the point in my life, I'm almost like at a sovereign citizen level, where like anytime I go through the border and I know everything's on the up and up, I'm almost like, give me a reason. Go ahead, take me in a second. Illegally charge me with something. I would make my damn day to drag this out in the legal system for the next 10 years. Like, and that's not rational at all, but that is how I feel. Today I fucked up post. To, to TIF you by daring the Canadian border agents to detain me. It turns out they do have some uh, administrative powers. Who knew? But, like, again, the U.S. border guard, you could ruin my weekend by being like, we're not allowing you to enter the U.S. today. And I would be like, well, that sucks. But, like, I don't know what a Canadian border guard can really do to me when I'm returning to my country and I have, like, a passport and a record of my citizenship. What are they going to... Like, you could be as big of an asshole as you want, but I'm pretty sure in, like, you know, at the end of the day, I'm probably going to be sleeping in my own bed. You can waste my time. What, what, a, a Canadian governmental uh, entity wasting my time? That's a new one. Cavity search? Honestly, dude, that's an open door right now. So if, if I was ever going to get a cavity search, now's the time. Because trust me, there's nothing in there. What about obstruction? Well, that's the thing is I'm actually... And this is probably why I've never had and may never have a problem uh, like in these situations. But I'm like a very compliant citizen. Like, I'm basically a sheep. When I go through the border, like, I don't, I'm not nervous because I'm not trying to smuggle, like, you know, 20 bottles of Jim Beam back when you're only allowed to take back six because you were there for 48 hours or whatever. I just, like, go to the country and, like, eat some food, sleep, and then come back the next day. So whenever they're like, you know, oh, what were you doing? Oh, what did you have for dinner? What was the side that went alongside the ribs that you had? I'm always like, dude, no matter, you're not gonna, you can trip me up, you know, you can catch me in like a speaking error or something like that. But at the same time, I mean, you, you could tear all the quarter panels off my car. You're not gonna find anything. I don't even eat in here. I feel like I'm uh, Candide and everybody else is Dr. Pangloss. Same shit with the grocery store. I'm like, the grocery store gives you like 0.1% cash back, only redeemable on... Uh, whole wheat bread from a specific brand for one week out of the year and i'm like that shit sucks everybody else is like well it's better than nothing i like to dream of a better world man they could have just given you nothing okay i mean i guess whole wheat bread is goaded not this whole wheat bread man not this whole wheat bread this is from bimbo international Let's all calm down and take a body break. With Hal Logan and Joanne McLeod. Here come the whole weed bread enjoyers to shit on the conversation. No, you're supposed to do... Um, it's the Monsters Inc. meme of all the monsters walking through the tunnel. And then the, the title is always like, Whole weed bread enjoyers on their way to add nothing to the conversation. You know what I'm talking about? You seen that one? Yes, yes. I've only seen the opera. Does Dr. Pangloss get syphilis in the book, Candide? Yes, he does. 
He gets syphilis and has to replace his uh, nose with a, like a brass nose. But he's still pogged. He's honestly like... You know, yeah, I don't have a nose anymore because of syphilis, but like, life's still pretty sick, Pog Poggy. Amazing, thank you. I love referencing one of the eight pieces of literature I read in freshman year English Lit. Or classics. Such as Antigone, uh, Oedipus Rex, Bartleby the Scrivener, Candide, Catch-22. We read that in the senior year of high school. We read um, one of the novella sections of the Brothers Karamazov. Or is, the, or is the Brothers Karamazov the novella section of War and Peace? I can, or Crime and Punishment. I can never remember. Both are true? That doesn't seem like that could be possible. Any true crime? I did not read any true crime in my English literature class. We, did, we watched season two of Making a Murderer on movie day. That's a joke. That came out like 15 years after I graduated from university. Oh yes, I, I read 1984 in 11th grade. Which is the year that the um, book was titled. That was actually 20 years after, but that's okay. I'm mad about 1984 because it actually is like an insanely good book. It sucks that it's um, become like co-opted as like the ultimate reference to any corporate policy that you don't like. I didn't think it was mid, but maybe it's because when I read it in 11th grade, I was also listening to The Lonesome Crowded West over and over. Maybe I just actually like The Lonesome Crowded West. At least you have money. At least I have chicken. Only millennials will get this. What infamous World of Warcraft player said, at least I have chicken. Careful. It's a tough one. Leroy Jenkins. How did you know that? Are you a gamer? Are you a memer? Keep calm and Leroy Jenkins on. It is an all-timer. This, this is a great video. Don't ruin this for them. It's all they have left. That meme is like 10.33 repeating, of course, years old. I don't know, dude. I think it's actually... I think it's like 18.33 repeating, of course, years old. That's got to be like a 2005 or 2004. I don't care if it's staged, okay? It's at least funny. There's a lot of staged content that's just like not good at all. I'm, I'm over this idea that like for something to be funny, it has to be like an authentic accident or something. If you can come up with a funny idea and execute on it, then more power to you. I'm not going to take that away from you. Like, did you, for, here's a great example of this, okay? In the psychotic uh, period known as the 2008 election campaign, a viral video came out, um, which was a parody, a seemingly sincere parody of the song It's Raining Men, except it was called It's Raining McCain. And the, the weather girls were singing, you know, God bless John McCain. He's a Vietnam veteran too. He went down to Vietnam. It, it's gonna start raining McCain. It's raining McCain. Hallelujah, it's raining McCain. Amen. I'm gonna go out. I'm gonna make sure I get absolutely John McCain. Anyway, so I, um, I loved this video because I thought, Wow, how self-unaware do you have to be to make and release this? And then, like years later, I was reading an interview with H. John Benjamin, and he was like, Oh yeah, I did this video like a long time ago called It's Raining McCain. And we did it as like a funny sort of like parody of where politics was at, but we released it as if it was sincere. And I was like, you're a damn... Genius, man. You had me completely fooled. So that was staged. But I think that because I was tricked by it, I have to acknowledge that it's it's Jester's immunity. It's, it's no longer like, oh, somebody made this and I am making fun of them. Instead, it's, it's just a joke. It's just become a joke. And I got to respect that. I think that was formative for me. For, for entering into the idea of, you know, who cares if something's staged as long as it's funny. Like everything on... Uh, SNL is staged but not funny. Everything on 
Well, most things on I Think You Should Leave are staged but humorous. I did love the... There's there's so many, like, I Think You Should Leave sports-themed accounts, which, you know, you can think of that what you will, but I find it funny because anytime anyone references I Think You Should Leave, I am forced to laugh. Um, but I loved when John Cooper, uh, the head coach of the Tampa Bay Lightning, gave that press conference last night, and he came out and said... I can't really talk about it. I'm just so upset for all the guys in the room right now because that goal shouldn't have counted, but I can't explain why yet. And then he left. And then the I think you should leave NHL meme uh, tweet was like, I, what? I went over to ask about the rule. It was so good. I, I love a, a professional sports coach being, I can't talk, or saying, I can't talk right now. That last goal shouldn't have counted, but I'm unable to say more right now. Source dude, just trust me. Tampa had seven players on the ice for the, for the goal. Is that, dude, that would be a great argument. If you think you're going to get scored on, just empty your whole bench onto the ice. Uh, excuse me, Gary Bettman. That goal against us shouldn't have counted because we had too many men on the ice. That's why he's he's getting nominated for the Jack Adams every year. I do remember like in a, in a similar vein, I was playing hockey on an outdoor rink. I don't know, I was like probably 8 with my dad and a you know, it, it, I I basically grew up in like a Norman Rockwell painting. So like in my the village I grew up in, there was a an an outdoor ice rink that was just like maintained by the community. So every Saturday and Sunday, people would get there and play like pickup hockey. And it would be, uh, you know, it, there'd be grown adults, there would be little kids, there'd be like every age in between. So you just kind of like, you know, it was just for fun. I remember uh, someone got past me and they were gonna score. I mean, it was open net, nobody's playing goalie. They were gonna score, so I just, took my stick and like slid it across the ice like like curling i was like shoo, like a spear across the ice and then the stick slid across the ice and knocked the dude's uh the puck off of his stick so he couldn't score and i was so excited i was like why don't people do that play all the time in real hockey and then it turns out that um if you do that in real hockey it's a automatic penalty shot which with an empty uh, net is an automatic goal. So, but it was very ingenious, ingenuitive. It's funny, we do it in open hockey. I, as long as everybody agrees, I guess it's okay. Sure, just don't get caught, forehead. I agree cool shit should be legal. Okay, this is possibly the most insane North American take of all time. But does anybody else, whenever they watch soccer, think that the penalty for handball is just like a little too high? Like I get that handball is like a serious deal in in football slash soccer, but like it's like a it's like the murder of soccer. If you accidentally touch the ball with your wrist, everybody on the field goes Aah! for like five minutes right in the referee's face. Like I. The ball's moving fast out there, man. Isn't it like if you if you get handball, it's an automatic red card or something like that? It just seems like, you know, accidentally you'd, you'd end up getting a lot of handballs. No, it's not. Is it an automatic penalty? Only if the handball denied a goal. You just don't know the rules, you're talking shit. Oh, I know handball is bad. And they don't treat it like basketball, where there's like a bunch of rules, but they don't enforce uh, half of them, like traveling and double dribbling. I don't even feel like handball is like that much of an advantage. Like, have you seen how fast a ball travels when you kick it at full speed versus how fast it would travel if you punched it? Like, it doesn't seem like it would help you that much. I think they should let him use the hands a little bit. Hand is OP for defense. Well, I think that's what they need then. Soccer's been way too offensive for too long. Most NA take ever. Okay, well, like, I think, and I actually like soccer. I don't watch a lot of it, but I was into it at, at the turn of the decade, you know, the 2010s. I watched a lot of Toronto FC as they were making their way through the CONCACAF Champions League. 
playing teams in Panama that played in like a high school stadium and then coming back for their home leg at uh, BMO Field. So I, I appreciate soccer. I will say though, they got to do something about the diving, man. It's just, I understand why it happens, but it's just so much. The, the advantage you get from diving and faking an injury is, is so high. I don't know what you can do about it. I'm, I'm just idly bringing up a complaint without even a proposed solution at all. But it's just so annoying. Like when a team is up 1-0, it's the second half. You know, you're at the 70th minute. And then somebody falls down and is like, ah, get the stretcher, get the stretcher, get the stretcher. And then like the stretcher comes out and they're shooting the Dr. Scholl's foot deodorant under their knee. Like, shh. They're chugging like two bottles of Gatorade while they sit on the field while the clock ticks up. And then, then they put them on the stretcher and they cart them off the field and they're getting ready to play again. And then the guy is just standing up on the edge of the field, like jumping up and down and stuff like that. And you're like, what the? You're not even injured, man. You're faking it. Or were you? Maybe he just got healed. I don't know what's in the spray bottle, but the health spray. Dude, the Metamist. This FIFA has had Metamist technology for like 20 years now. He's, call it liquid cocaine. 50% Goldschlager, 50% Jägermeister. Kids are spraying it on their ankles to induce a healing factor. One time in Hull. So Hull, the, the legal drinking age in Ontario is 19 and the legal drinking age in Quebec is 18. So, oftentimes, 18-year-old Ontarians will cross the border in the Hull, which is a first town across the Ontario-Quebec border, in order to get legally drunk and then go home and sleep. Um, so, th this, is, th this sets the stage of where I was at. I was 18. We went to Hull. I went to a bar where we sat outside on, like, Canadian tire deck chairs. And I was like, I'm a fidgety kid, you know? At, at that age, at least. So I was um, leaning back on this chair. I was doing like the one-legged deck chair. You know what I mean? When you get like a plastic deck chair and you can lean back on one leg and balance and you can even kind of go like this a little bit. You can kind of put in a little because there's a flexion on the plastic. Anyway, um, who would have thought after doing this for about 10 minutes, the leg snapped off. And I was like, oh shit, the bar is going to make me pay for this deck chair. So I just like moved the chair off to the side and then shoved the broken chair leg like in my waistband and covered it up with my shirt <laughs> and paid my tab and walked out. And then I remember this, this is a real story. I mean, it's not that like crazy. It's just sort of funny. After, right after that, we went to like a nightclub. And as soon as I got onto the dance floor, I pulled out the the plastic like chair leg and was just holding it up in the in the club like yeah 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 yeah. And then security just came over to me and like grabbed it out of my hands. And then I looked him in the face and he was like, and I was like, okay, that makes a lot of sense. But dude, how cool would that have been? I would be like the guy at the club with a chair leg. Holy cow. People would have been like, whoa, what's that guy up to? He's got the chair leg. Hey, what are you up to, chair leg guy? Nothing much. Just being badass with my chair leg. Legendary moment. We still talk about chair leg guy. Just arrived, her chair leg guy was here. I knew it. I knew I heard people talking about me. I knew I made it into the cultural consciousness. I'm like the Kingstonian Xanta, but without all the really troubling allegations. So for the lore masters in chat, Xanta is um, a Toronto area street performer who um, wears a Santa hat and has no shirt on and is insanely jacked. And he would just like, you'd just see him on like the subway uh, or like outside of your school and he would be talking to himself and like punching himself in the face and stuff like that. But then he would go down and do like 70 push-ups straight. He's kind of like, I get, he was sort of like a local, I don't know, like a folk hero. And then he's maybe on like the 
sex offender registry or something? Like, I, I don't really know. He fell from grace in a big way. Say it, he was a hero? I'm not gonna say that he was a hero, especially after what I just said. Local lore people are the best. Dude, I mean, honest, every city's got them, right? Like, there's known, uh, known elements in Kingston, for sure. Vancouver's got some. Roller Girl, several unicycle people I, I see now and then. Sometimes I'll go, like, two years without seeing unicycle people. And then I'll see one of them, like, ripping it up Mount Pleasant on their unicycle, like, faster than somebody that's using a, a real bike. And I'm like, they're still, they're still here. They're... They made it through the pandemic. Opera guy. I didn't realize. So there's a guy in Vancouver who walks down Commercial Drive just singing opera. There was a thread like a month ago that was like, has any has anybody seen Opera Guy lately? I'm worried about him. And I was like, let's see what's up with Opera Guy. And then uh, every single post was just about how much of an asshole he was. Opera, I fucking hate Opera Guy. He would always come into my coffee shop and ask for Diet Coke, and we would tell him that we don't have Diet Coke, and then he would go, fa la 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 and I'm like, D I didn't read, I thought he was just like a guy would, he had some quirks or something like that, but I guess he's going around like, uh, like just kind of being a, an asshole to people. Victoria has Darth Fiddler, a guy in a Darth Vader mask on a hoverboard who fiddles. It's crazy, man. Honestly, like, that's kind of annoying. But it's also, like, I feel like that's a vestige of what cities used to be like before they got, you know, condos got turned into um, unregulated bank accounts for the uber rich. And people, like, stopped living in cities and instead just treated them as, like, a savings account. Used to be chock full of crazy characters like that. Nowadays, there's, like, less crazy characters, more investors, and the crazy characters are actually, like, um, dangerous. They're not like Darth Vader on a hoverboard. It's like, oh yeah, watch out for that guy. He has a knife. That's knife guy. I think I told this before, but there's a guy like in our neighborhood and I see him now and then, but like he's, he's like on and he's off. Like there's some days I see him and he's just walking his dog and he's like smiling. But then one time I was walking with my parents and he was blasting music on his bike and he was coming the other way on the bike lane and he was like, that's right, baby. We're going to send all you guys back to your country. He was like, look at me dead in the face. We're going to send you back to your country where you belong. MAGA 2024, baby. MAGA 2024. And I was like, what the hell is going on with this? It's, we're not even in America. And then I was like, that's really weird. And I was almost a little taken aback. Okay, I was like, oh my God. What's going on? And then later that day, I was on my patio, and I just hear it coming from like a different, like from a, the, around the corner, and then I see him cross with his dog. He's going, we're going to fix this country. Trump's going to come in here and clean all this stuff up. And I was like, oh, he, that's just his thing. That's just like, what? okay. So it went from like being scared to almost being a little bit more like sympathetic. I was like, okay. At first, I was like, this guy's about to commit like, I don't know, like a crime or something, but now he's just become a character in the running cast of people that I that I see in my life. Guy who thinks he lives in America, I guess. But he's not always... And I've seen him, I don't know, maybe like five times. Three out of five times he's been spouting that stuff. Two out of five times, it looks like he's just been having a nice walk with his dog. So, I don't know. <laughs> Still not great, but... Uh, on average, yeah, you forty percent chance to not get yelled at uh, when you walk by him. I mean, there's there's parts of the city where you would have a worse batting average than that. To be honest, I can live with that. Also, I know how this sounds. It sounds like I'm taking his side, but anytime I've uh, been subject to his rhetoric, it's always been when I've like been on my own or walking with other adults, and anytime he's kept quiet around me. It's been because I have my baby, I think. So I'm like, at least he's, uh, at least he respects the sanctity of the father-daughter walk. Speaking of the MAGA story, how many F. Trudeau flags do you see? Honestly, not that many. I, I hear it's widespread in um, parts of the country. Every once in a while, like I was getting bubble tea for Kate a couple of months ago, and there was a truck parked outside, and the truck just had like the most insane paint job on the doors I'd ever seen. It was like, um, 
proud to be considered a member of the deplorable class of Canada 2022 or so. And I was just like, holy cow. This is just, I'm just trying to get some damn tea here or something like that. But this, like you've actually like turned your truck into a, into a billboard, which is, I mean, I, honestly further than I'm willing to go at least. I do see it now and then. I understand that this is going to sound like it's a, a, like a punchline or an own, but I swear to you it's my legitimate, genuine observation. The most F. Trudeau stickers I ever see is in the Wendy's parking lot. Like, I very rarely see them actually driving, but anytime I pass by, like, this one specific Wendy's, there's usually, like, one or two in the in the parking lot. So I don't know if it's like that's where the the meetup happens or something like that. I know you're a truck lover. What's your favorite truck? I'm a big fan. Well, this is not a truck, but here's another tweet that I thought it, it popped into my head the other day. Who the fuck drives a GMC Suburban? Have you seen the size of this vehicle? I do. If you do, I just need to know why. It's too big for it's too big to be practical, man. My uncle does. He transports construction equipment. Okay, your uncle, when I become prime minister, I'm not coming for his suburban, okay? His suburban can stay. He appears to have a genuine... Wait, no, he's not transporting construction equipment in his suburban. It's like a closed cab stretch limousine. You know, he's not putting a, a like a bulldozer in the back of that thing. It doesn't even make any sense. It's like a six door. It doesn't even have a bed. What if you have, like, five kids? I I would accept it, kind of, except I still just think you should get, like, a minivan or something with a, you know, a foldable third row of seating or something like that. Like, a Suburban is so freaking huge. It's enormous. Yeah, can't you get sedans that seat seven these days? A Suburban might be my most hated vehicle on the road. I don't know if you can buy a GMC Suburban. My my, and this is perhaps ignorant. My perception is that the only people who drive GMC Suburbans think that they're better than everybody else, and that's why they feel so much so comfortable taking up so much damn room. What do you think about the Escalade? I I feel the same thing. Um, the Escalade, a Hummer, GMC Suburban, like a Lincoln Navigator. They, to me, it just seems like a lot of a lot of vehicles that are big for for big sake. At least a Jeep has like and and you know I've talked before about how I feel about Jeeps. People will be like, uh, you know, hey, my Jeep Liberty has amazing off road potential. Oh yeah, where do you drive it mostly? Oh, uh, corner of Robson and Smythe. But at least, like, there's some utility there. But I feel like a Suburban and, like, all those other, like, huge SUVs are just big for big sake. At least a truck, like, in theory, there's some utility associated with it. So I, do I get annoyed when I almost get monster trucked by, like, a lifted Dodge Ram on Highway 1? Yeah, but at least, like, while my skull was being crushed into my thoracic cavity, I would be like, yeah, but you never know when he might pick up, like, a bunch of soil from Home Depot. I can't really fault him for that. I would buy a Corolla if Sam Elliott did the ads. Dude, don't even get me started on the Dennis Leary ads. Did you I didn't know this. Did you know that uh, Dennis Leary and Bill Hicks were friends? And then Dennis Leary recorded an album, played it for Bill Hicks, and Bill Hicks said, uh, basically, you stole my whole act, including lifting several jokes, uh, like, literally wholesale. And then they ceased being friends. I had no idea. Though it does make sense, there are a lot of similarities between the Bill Hicks routines and, and Dennis Leary's entire personality. I got nothing against Dennis Leary necessarily, I just like... I just don't like the trucks that he does ads for, I guess. <laughs> and as a result, I brought up perhaps the most... Uh, I don't know, the sorest moment for him in his entire life, which is maybe not that necessary, but anyway. Um, I will say, when I picked up my, my daughter from daycare on, I think on Monday, 
The dad who knows what streaming is was like, hey, how are you doing? A lot of the streamers that I watch have been like, their view counts have been cut by like 60%. Like, are you, are you okay? And I was like, yeah, I, I didn't have the heart to explain to him why people watch me to begin with. Cause honestly, I don't even know the, the answer to that question, but I was like, yeah, I'm doing okay. But I think he might think that I'm like losing my job right now, basically. He was talking to me, he was like, oh man, even like Nick Merckx used to get like 45,000 viewers and now he only gets like 20, which is still, obviously that's still a lot, but I don't, I don't know what's going on in the industry right now. And I was like, you know, I mean, we had a good conversation about it. Like I was, I was like, well, you know, if, if you're watching people that predominantly play like first person shooters, like their numbers will rise and fall based on, uh, you know, where the, if there's any big games that are out in that industry or like, I know he watches a lot of Apex and like, I guess there haven't, hasn't been much content in Apex lately. So it's, you know, you're right. I, I, I need to tell, I'm like a dividend stock, you know, I'm not like Tesla stock. I'm like Coca-Cola. You check Coca-Cola stock price in the bear market, 45 bucks. You check it in the, in the bull market. 52 bucks. It's not moving that much, but every year the dividend check still comes in on the X dividend date. P multiples staying roughly the same. Let me see how true that is. Let me get KO stock price. 61 bucks. What the hell? Consumer staples uh, are thriving in a bear market. What's your one year chart look like? Plus 14% one year. What's your year to date? 4% up year to date? Dude, here's how the recession is good for Coca-Cola. Holy cow. It's got to be like the only stock on the planet that's that's got a pot. Well, it's still negative real return, but still. Anyway, what am I even talking about? Slash markers. <laughs> you look slimmer. Have you lost weight? Thank you for noticing. Um, I started exercising regularly in about November and have maintained a, a rigorous Peloton streak since then. And then that progress was doubled over the course of the past week when I crapped my brains out 10 times a day with uh, food poisoning. I did have the, I had the first moment when I went to, uh, when I picked up my daughter from daycare yesterday, I looked in the elevator mirror on the way down to parking and I was like, you look like shit. <laughs> I like you, you you need to eat something not like I got too skinny but like I got decrepit over the past week I needed to like I needed that refeed last night that saved me you always need a swan but to sell a 6-4 with two attack upside every time just to get a swan out there I can't bring myself to do it, man. I just can't bring myself to do it. What did the other parents say when you mentioned the food poisoning? They were trying to like stay with me, right? Like they were like, oh yeah, I've had food poisoning before. Come on, man. I was like, uh, yeah, well, I'm still presently suffering from some of his ill effects. How are you supposed to compete with that? I mean, I was like the king of the, of the daycare for sure. There's no doubt, like last week, I had the highest ELO of suffering of anybody at the daycare. And it feels good, honestly. At least it, it wasn't all for nothing. I gotta tell you, I'm a little bit scared because um, I'm right next to me is a LaCroix can. I had some LaCroix uh, last night. And it, I drank all the water, but it's fizzing right now. Like it, it's... I don't know if you can still hear it. It's still active. Okay, I'm going to tell you I'm dumb. That was actually the sound of my Venetian blinds hitting the window because the fan is now pointed in this direction. It turns out it was not the sound of a sparkling water can now that I, now that I had a chance to investigate it. You yeah, a miffed muffin. That's perfect. Miffed muffin sounds like if there was like a strain of marijuana that made you angry, they would make the edibles for it. No one would buy that one. You wouldn't eat a food that makes you angry, and yet you own the bomb hot sauce. Curious. Mike Tyson came out with a weed, str a weed strain called Undisputed. Crazy, man. 
Celebrities really just be doing anything these days, huh? I did see Snoop Dogg has a, a, a brand, I think it's of gin. It's called Indago, like Indigo. Very clever. Very clever, Snoop. So humorous. I see what you did there. You know what? Take some stats. I did see the fake uh, Snoop Dogg at the crypto convention who uh, legally had to inform people that he was not Snoop Dogg and instead was Doop Snog. This is a very funny photo. The hyena is good. Josh, you don't understand that you saying the hyena is good is uh, the ultimate indicator that I could ever need to know that it's actually ass. Because you don't know what you're talking about in this game. This game is ass. Don't you, I see what you type in the group chat. Josh doesn't want me to let you guys know, but unfortunately he is coming for me. So I have to out him. Josh is actually not a normie uh, or not a core gamer anymore. He's gone full normie. His messages in our group chat are always like, oh, I was playing Forza this weekend on Game Pass. Oh, hey, do you guys want to get together and play a little of Halo Master Chief Collection on the Xbox Series X? He's just become like a normal guy, and it's kind of sad. It's true, it's true. It is true. I, w I wouldn't lie to you. Master Chief Collection is good, though. Yeah, okay. Are you one of Bungie's many remote workers from across the United States? No. So you're just doing their community work for them for free? Seriously, though, want to play TMNT? I don't know. I've been kind of like interested in checking out Shredder's Revenge. But I just, I, I can't shake the feeling that's like... Almost all beat-em-ups are just so damn boring. Like, they just are... I'm always like, oh, this looks like fun. And then for, like, the first half hour, I'm having, like, a pretty good time. And then after that, I'm like, why am I still playing this? I'm just mashing the X button and walking to the right over and over. Wholly non-based. Well, I don't, I'm just... I am as God made me, you know? I just... I, I kind of felt like beat-em-ups made a lot of sense uh, in the earlier age of the world when they weren't able to have that much complexity in their games. Like Super Auto Pets, for example. <laughs> Dude, I'm getting my ass beat in this. Maybe I should be playing something more my speed. Dude would rather play his lame auto chess than hang with his homies on Xbox. The reason I don't want to hang with my homies on Xbox is because you motherfuckers all work normal jobs in the East Coast. The shit is infuriating, man. You, you start gaming at like 4 p.m. my time. That's like, that's peak insanity. I got to go pick up my daughter from daycare, get groceries, bring her home, cook dinner, feed dinner to my daughter while also my wife and I eat dinner ourselves. It's baby bath time. It's... Uh, you know, I mean, you get the gist of it. That's basically like four to seven right there. Guilty, guilty. Start playing some shit at like 10 p.m. Pacific time on a weekday. That would be fine. That would save me a lot of problems. That's only 1 a.m. your time. I don't see what the issue is. This kills me. Dude, I, I'm not even joking with you. I hate you East Coast motherfuckers. <laughs> None of you have, et you you all, hey, let's go spend uh, some time in, oh, I didn't save two gold. Oh, you know what? Get out of here. You stink anyway. Let's go spend the weekend together in Buffalo. Let's go, hey, I'm going up to Toronto this weekend. Hey, do you guys all want to go to Florida together? Never once has anyone suggested, like, crossing the Mississippi River. Shit drives me crazy, man. Vancouver, Seattle. Portland, Los Angeles, San Francisco. There's so many great cities you could be coming to visit over here. The, the most west that they choose to visit is always like Indianapolis. They're not even going through to Chicago. Meet them in the middle? What are you talking about? The last time, <laughs> last time I, I went to see Josh, I went to his damn house, man. He doesn't even live in a place that has a direct flight to Vancouver. I had to make a connection. And then, the, this is, but this is how I know you're from the East Coast, because you're saying, oh, meet me in the middle. Why would I meet you in the middle? We got LA, Seattle, Portland, and Vancouver. And I visited you, because Malv does the same thing. 
2015, we came to visit Malf in Toronto. Then we'll be like, hey, when are you coming to Vancouver? And he's like, oh, make me. I don't know why people from the East Coast are like so afraid of being exposed to a part of the world where they're not under the boot of blizzards six months out of the year. I think they're worried that they wouldn't be able to come back. It's like how when you're in the grind, you're like, I have to just keep grinding. I have to just keep grinding because if I ever take a second and relax, then I'm going to realize how fucked up my existence has been to this point. They're like, oh, no, sorry. I wouldn't dare ever leave Toronto in January is so idyllic. Makes me sick, dude. Makes me want to throw up. Not really, but like a little bit. Josh, I didn't invite anyone to my wedding. Don't, don't use an ad hominem attack, an appeal to vulnerability or whatever. It's not my fault. I know, but like, you know, it's not like I invited Malf and I didn't invite you. I invited my parents. I didn't invite my grandparents. <laughs> At this stage, you need a lemon. Whoa, what the heck? I accidentally clicked on something in Windows that made all my active windows tessellate out in front of me? What button is that, man? I felt like I was Tom Cruise in Minority Report. Holy cow, that scared the crap out of me. That's a win tab. Holy cow. Win tab. We're on borrowed time, man. That launched in Windows 7 15 years ago? Listen. <laughs> I don't come to this website to be abused, okay? Where do you go to be abused then? Um, 30 minute 80s ride with Bradley Rose on the Peloton. I like Bradley's rides. He's a little too happy for me. So here's my, my current Peloton rotation. I used to be very particular about my instructor. I only rode with Sam Yo until uh, Peloton Studios put out a hit on Sam Yo, and for whatever reason, they only let him do 10-minute low-impact rides, which don't interest me. I know you're all very interested in this, by the way. So now, I go to the most recent classes, and I'm like, okay. I, I, it's, for me, it's all about programming. Not, I don't vibe with all the personalities, but if I can get a Cody Rigsby ride, I know he programs some heavy hills. I like that. If I can get a Bradley Rose ride, I know he's, he's got a good mix of, uh, of speed ups and jogs. If I can get a Ben Aldis ride, he also goes pretty hard out of the saddle. I'm into that. Otherwise, hey, Dennis Morden, probably the best music tastes on the whole platform. Every other uh, instructor has god-awful like uh, boomer core playlists. Dennis Morden at least has some cool ones sometimes. Oh, God, here comes the copy pasta. <laughs> anyway, that's where I'm at. Occasional Emmy, uh, Emma Lovewell ride. Occasional Alex Toussaint ride. I would ride with Matt Wilpers more if he didn't just do uh, Power Zone. You know, I'll, I'll, if, I'll make it stop. If, or it, Will you make it stop if I read it? Hey, NL, been following your content since the EU four days, much love from your far superior cousin, America. Always the case, no matter how much Canadian propaganda you push. Keep up the good work, man. You've always been funny just now that people are noticing it. So thank you for always being consistent for us rouge-like lovers. You're welcome. <laughs> are, we, are we done? <laughs> All right. I thought it would be worse than that. Because you said you watched EU4. And I feel like when I played the EU4, the Paradox community was in a good place. And then Hearts of Iron 4 came out. And then I'll just be like browsing Reddit and the top post will be like, look at my Nazi Germany. And it's just like the whole world map covered in that like uh, the, the gray German blob color. Surprisingly wholesome. Excuse me? Bueller? Tomorrow's stream? Escape from Tarkov first? I know that they just came out with that game, you know, The Cycle or whatever it's called, but I want to go back to the OG. I respect the classics. That's two wins, by the way. We're going to do Tarkov. Then we're going to do a miniature campaign in um, March of the Eagles, the Paradox Grand Strategy game. Following that, I will be playing against Grandmaster Yasser Sirawan, 
in a 12-match Blitz uh, showcase. And then playing an entire game of Dungeons & Dragons with the team from Critical Role. I'm very excited. All the things that have been requested for years that I know people would hate are coming back. You know what? Let me be a circular stinker. Go to dock it. Go, I, I can already tell you what the comments would look like on the on the subreddit that day. Yo, this dock it's amazing. Anyway, I was watching Tim the Tap Man, so I didn't get to check out the stream, but were there any pog moments I missed? Yo, dude, this dock it was incredible. I was listening to podcasts all day because I don't like I just don't watch the stream anymore, but it the idea of this show is incredible. Let's go! Thank you. You see this? I was dominating mid lane when my wife brought me a bag of Miss Vicky's jalapeno chips not asked for. How did he find Zoms? Okay, so when Team Unity was going through some existential crises and we couldn't bring ourselves to play Fortnite anymore because not everybody in the squad was 100% down with it, we, Dan started suggesting these like 2D VRs that he was familiar with, one of which is Zoms. Um, but the first time we played it, we didn't have streamer mode on, and the whole in game chat was just inundated with racial slurs. So obviously, like, that was not a great situation, <laughs> to put it mildly. <laughs> but then I went back to it with streamer mode on and was like what the heck this game's incredible and it's been part of the lexicon ever since mm. i gotta say miss vicky's jalapeno if we did a tier list of potato chips i mean it's it's in the s tier there's no doubt about that It might not be at the very, very tippy, tippy top, but it's it's closer to the tippy, tippy top than the tippy bottom. You should really get paid to say that. No, you only have to pay me to endorse like middling products. If a product is just good, then I'm just so excited to be consuming it in the first place, I'd happily endorse it. Let's go. How much time we got? 30 seconds. Mm. Normally I hit those, man. Normally that's an easy hit in my world. Now just, you know what? I got 19 seconds. Take a little potato chip. I'm ready. And I eat it. And I oop. And then you take a chip and you eat it. Three three gamers remain. You just gotta check. I hear you. I heard you. No, no, no. No, oh, I gotta admit, he had superior gamesmanship. He he rushed me after I took out the guy in third. That's fair enough. Pay out the second places. She said one sec, but I'm already off the clock. Now this is mukbang. How do they do this, man? You know how they do this? Ingredient number one in potato chips. What do you think it is? Type your answer in chat right now. 
Potatoes? Wrong. Specially selected potatoes. I wonder what kind of legal red tape you got to run through to be able to write that in the ingredient list. Like, does somebody from the Canadian FDA have to watch you throw, like, a green potato in the organics bag or something? Vegetable oil, seasoning powder, maltodextrin, salt, dextrose, onion powder, torula yeast, spices, whey powder, paprika, vegetable oil, garlic powder, jalapeno pepper powder, natural flavor, contains milk. I mean, this is why you gotta like it, okay? Because it's really only three ingredients, as long as you just count seasoning as one ingredient as long as you compress all those chemicals and spices that were in the seasoning mix that's that's three ingredients man that's downright wholesome mm. cholesterol free no MSG, no preservatives. Uh, what do you call salt then, Miss Vicky? <laughs> oh, man. They're going to be so embarrassed when I take them to the Supreme Court over this. Anyway, um, Kate's live. I'm going to send you over there. <laughs> the end of the stream is always a bit wild, and I'll see you uh, tomorrow.